Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Chef Nikhil Abavula, uh, owner and executive chef of Ruby 30A and Nanbu Noodle Bar in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. Rue 30A is the recipient of numerous awards, including the best new restaurant. It was built on the idea that the most intimate thing that you can do is break bread with your family. Chef Abu Vala recognized his fierce passion for cooking before he could even reach the kitchen countertop. Helping his grandmother roll out fresh Indian flatbread was one of the early motivations for him to pursue culinary arts, a career that started at the age of 13. Over his 20-year career, he has cooked in kitchens of nearly 30 countries, developing a meaningful understanding of global ingredients, food, culture, and culinary entertainment. Join me as I chat with Chef about community, cultivating relationships through shared traditions, and immersive culinary experiences. And there he is. Good morning, Chef. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. I'm good. Wonderful. How are you? I'm drained. I'm drained. There's a lot up there in that intro. Um, it it kind of (laughs) exhausted me a little bit there, but man, it is so, so good to see you. We haven't met yet, but, um, done a lot of research and fascinating, fascinating career. So let's set the stage a little bit. Uh, so everybody kind of knows where you are, talked about it a little bit. So you, you are in the panhandle of Florida, Mm -hmm. so you're closer to, you know, Louisiana and all that. Tell me, tell me a little bit about, uh, the area where, where you live. Yeah, so we're in the Panhandle. We're in a place called Santa Rosa Beach. Uh, Santa Rosa Beach is uh, kind of right in the middle of, uh, people might be familiar with Destin or Panama City. We're, we're almost smack dab right in the middle of those two cities. Uh, and it's just a really cool community. of. Uh, so it's a beach, beach town community. We're right on the beach. Uh, and there's about 18 different, like, very unique developments um, that are, you know, kind of their own towns. Uh, along this stretch of beach, and we're a very, very small. I mean, uh, we we kind of also recognize ourselves as uh, kind of like A one A is in South Florida. We have our thirty A. So okay. You might see a blue sticker even all the way up in Boulder, Colorado. You might see a blue sticker that has a thirty A um, on the back of it. That's that's from us. So I, okay, uh, I love that. All right, hence the restaurant. Um, yeah, very cool. rents, Yeah, so it's kind of a uh, actually Rue um, uh, originally um, kind of a play on words there. R U E Rue means street. So we're just taking the culinary aspect of that Rue 38. That's how we kind of I just I it. just got a chill hearing that. That is so brilliant. I read it. I, I I figured it had something to do with the, you know, the culinary term, but that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. What uh, what else is uh brilliant is uh your your staging here. What what's the the book up on, on top there? Food and life. Food and life, yes, of course. That's a fantastic book. Um, uh, you know, kind of talks about um, you know, using fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, and how it pertains to you know each ingredient and how it pertains to your life. So it's a big, big fan of it. So uh, yeah, it's my this we're in my office here. I'm actually at home right now. But my uh, original office was in uh, one of my restaurants has turned into more of a storage unit. Uh, that happens. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so I had to turn one of my bedrooms into an office in order to work. So for sure. Um, when you when you turned, I thought I saw some Escoffier stuff. Yeah, they're, going they're on down there, down the there right? Got, Look at that. Escoffier, we got Larousse. You know, you gotta you gotta get back to the classics too. I mean, we all started there, so you that's do. Super important. Yeah. I absolutely love that. So mm-hmm. this this is gonna be so much fun. So, um, what what I love more than anything, and I just kind of want to jump right into it, is on your website this idea, and I think it's the kind of the idea for the restaurant, this idea of breaking bread with your family. So let's start there. It's 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 part of how you market the restaurant. It's part of the vision that you share on, on your website. And I'm quoting from the website. This is phenomenal. Quote, from the moment you enter intimate space to the time you leave, that's exactly how you'll feel, like family. Between our community tables and open kitchen concept, you're invited to sit back and enjoy as food gets transformed to art and strangers become friends. That's absolutely brilliant. Tell me about that. Is is that all you, or did that uh, was that? Yeah, a I mean, dream. You know, it's funny. Is that you know, I don't, I don't think that um, anything starts out as you originally planned it to be. I mean, you know, when I uh, when I opened up this restaurant here, I mean, I didn't really, you know, I wanted to. I actually didn't plan on opening a restaurant. I, I wanted to. Uh, I was working in Miami and part of this great restaurant group down there. And uh, kind of had to come up here. My, my uh, family had moved up here, and uh, you know, my mom needed a little bit of help, and so I decided I'll come up here and 
Um, I was looking at these uh, restaurants that were in Santa Rosa Beach, and none of them really were appeasing to me. They, you know, we had uh, a couple of inns, and um, you know, no no culinary destinations uh, as per se. And that's you know kind of my whole career and mindset's been around you know brilliant food. So I said, well, I guess I'll uh, try and do my own thing. So um, you know, uh, with my mother's help. Um, you know, founded this tiny, tiny 800 square foot space, um, originally 800 square foot called Re 30A. And it was just based on the idea, like, you know, let's, let's get by. And, um, you know, I didn't, didn't want to be a caterer. didn't want to do private events. I wanted to be a restaurant, but I also knew that like, uh, you know, I couldn't afford to buy the food, uh, and then sell it. I had to sell the food first and then buy it. So started with <laughs> private events and kind of designed the space around it and, you know, it was like, you know, we're, we're really, what I'm really about is uh, kind of that sense of community and, and through my travels. I mean, that's why I was able to travel and all that was because of the different communities that I was a part of it in those times. So, um, you know, as we developed the concept and grew it, it would, I realized that, you know, that really, that sense of, um, like in, in Europe, that sense of sitting down at a restaurant and it's just one big table. You know, you go, you go to Germany and you go to these um, restaurants and it's, it is just one big table and you're sitting next to all these strangers and you just become friends and even if you don't speak the language that by the end of the night you know you feel like that's you know your brother or your sister that you you know always had so um, that kind of European approach was so amazing and uh, I really made it part of the driving aspect of our restaurant and you know having these community tables and having people you know four to sit next to each other I mean you don't really unless you decide that we have you know these big 12 person tables unless you decide to sit you know, a 12 people, you're going to be sitting next to someone and it's just so cool. Um, and it is, I mean, you know, we have people that formed companies, you know, um, the restaurant will be 10 years this March and, you know, we have people that started businesses together. We have people that got married. We have, I mean, it's just so cool um, to be a part of our little space there. That that is a great story. Congratulations too on all all this success. That was going to be my next uh, my next question, and you led right into it. A very European approach, and it all kind of makes sense now, right? And um, yeah, in Germany they're called Stammtisches. And I, how was that received at first when 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 you first started doing that with your yeah? Guests? I mean, um, you know, and even to this day, I mean, still we still we try to do our best to let people know at multiple steps, like hey. By the way, you're going to be sitting next to someone you don't know. Um, and in the beginning, it was a little, little rough. But ultimately, you know, even though we're in Florida, we're more part of the South than we are anything else. And, you know, this is a tourist town. And our tourist town is, um, you know, the, the feeder markets here are all major Southern cities. So, you know, there is a, a that Southern, you know, hospitality aspect of people are not necessarily unfamiliar with the idea of sitting next to a stranger and, um, you know, might have gone to a, a dinner party and sat next to a stranger that way. So uh, I feel like we benefit from where we're located uh, in that sense. And it might have been harder if we were in the Northeast or, or somewhere else where we'd have to get people used to like being elbow to elbow with someone who you know nothing know nothing about. And so obviously that you know there's some people who wanted to come in and do like a really intimate like dining experience with their date and this that wasn't this the spot for them. Um but uh you know we try to still make it you know that that family aspect of like let's welcome you to our family. We still do our best, you know, through our service and through trying to make them feel extra special that you know we tend to get rid of all those issues. No, I love that. Just the other day, there's a there's a place here in Boulder called the Bohemian Beer Garden. So it's uh it's all stumptishes, you know, with a big bar in the middle. And that exact thing occurred. My wife and I sat down for a late lunch, and uh, there was another group, on uh, you know, on the table already, and they were talking about, and and we weren't trying to, you know, uh, listen in on their conversation, but it's kind of hard not to, right? Um, and uh, they were talking about, you know, trying to find a place where they can do cooking lessons on the weekend, ironically enough. So it didn't take long for me to just kind of slide the card over and say, Hey, we should talk. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a good feeling. It's very natural, right? You're there for the, for the same reasons, right? Good food, good company, good, good beverages. Hopefully, you know, you have such, um, you know, as I read chef, uh, your story, it's, it's an enriched story, uh, and, and how you came to love cooking 
you know, in the aha moment, when you, when you realize that you could cook for a living, like we, that, that, that happened to all of us, right? I can do this for a living. And there is that one moment when we all decide it's okay. This is not just a thing I can do. This is a thing that I want to make, you know, my life. Can you, can you discuss a little bit, take us back um, to your grandmother and, and kind of describe what it was like growing up in, in her kitchen, let's say. Yeah. I mean, so, um, when I was growing up, um, you know, I'm, I'm half Indian. Um, so my father is from Mumbai, uh, in India and, uh, you know, he's got three sisters who are all, all from there and pretty much his, all of his sisters and, and my father himself moved to America to kind of create their own life and their own, uh, fortune. And, um, my father had met my mother and, um, you know, they decided they were doing what's the wholesale gift industry and, uh, decided to start their own business. And, um, when they went to start their own business, um, you know, they didn't have a lot of money and couldn't really take care of me per se by themselves. And they couldn't afford a nanny. Uh, so they just brought my grandmother over, uh, from India and, uh, she came and for the first, you know, four or five years of my life, you know, she was, she was there with me every day. So, um, while my parents were working, so, um, you know, I had, uh, and I'm very fortunate. She's still alive today. She's, uh, just had her 95th birthday. Oh, that's 10, amazing. 10 wow. days ago, you know, 10 days ago, wow. 95. So, um, she's absolutely this hilarious little Indian woman who's, you know, four, <laughs> she was five, now she's four foot 10, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she's very good age, but she she's, better not hear you say that. Yeah. Oh, no. I make fun of her all the time. She, she's so, she's so hilarious. But, um, you know, so my beginning part of my life, I spent so much time with her. And, you know, her passion has always been was just cooking and, you know, um, and same like, you know, my mother is a white woman from Long Island, New York. And, you know, when she joined the family, you know, you know my mother's a good, great cook in her own right. Uh, but she had to learn how to make Indian food because she was like a requirement to join our family. Sure. <laughs> um, so my, uh, but, but, but my grandmother raised me. And so she was always cooking and like, it was just me and her. So, um, you know, I kind of joined her and she kind of direct me around the kitchen and tell me what to do. And, it, you know, whether it's standing on this little chair and rolling flatbreads or, you know, um, grabbing spices or, you know, stirring something. I mean, it was, so that's their, my, first memories I ever really ever had was with her and cooking and doing all that and just so wonderful although the very first memory I have is um in that same house that we were in where there was a screen door that like had a lock on it and uh, she went outside to smoke and I like pushed the door and then it locked and then she was locked out I just remember her screaming at me trying to get her in and I didn't understand so I guess my very first memory is locking my grandmother out of the house just for a couple hours or it felt like a couple hours. Uh, and then the second member would be cooking with her. So, yeah. How how proud of you is she? Oh, she's immensely proud. I mean, you know, it took her a while to figure it out. Um, sure. You yeah. know, because and we'll get into that a little later, but, um, but, you know, she's immensely proud and, you know, she's such a wonderful woman and she has so many grandkids and, um, you know, great grandkids now with, with my other um, cousins and, um, you know, she's really the matriarch of our family. I love it. I love it. Was it, was it your grandmother or your parents that uh, enrolled you in sushi making classes? When yeah. You were... So, I mean, it was, uh, it was actually my mother. Um, you know, when I, um, you know, with my family and we, one of the big things with us was we wouldn't like get like big gifts, but we would go travel. Um, so travel was always a big part of it. And um, like one of my first forays into strange food, which for me, like Indian food was normal and like American food was normal. But, you know, um, I had when I was eight years old, I, I first got into sushi. Um, and I, I guess uh, my dad was playing a joke on me at the sushi restaurant. And um, he had ordered, he had told me I'd eat, I, could, I would eat sushi if I would eat everything that was put in front of me, no matter what. Um, and uh, this <laughs> like big black cauldron comes out and they open the lid. There's four little octopus swimming around and they were, and then he's like, you have to eat that. So I, my first First time ever experienced sushi. I had baby live octopus. And, uh, you know, as an eight-year-old boy, I was grossed out and also very excited at the same time. So <laughs> I, I never really looked back. So this passion for like sushi and Asian cuisine and Japanese culture and, and Chinese culture kind of grew immensely in that moment. So, 
um, when I was 13, I was I had bugged my parents all the time, like I want to learn how to make sushi, like I want to do this. And then when I was 13, my mom's like, hey, I literally actually it was two weeks before my 13th birthday. Um, she was like, well, let's go on this. Uh, there's this little cooking class in our town. Let's go. Um, so I went and, you know, it was me and a bunch of 35 year old women um, <laughs> learning how to make sushi. And uh, I mean, it was so much fun. Do those uh, techniques find their way into uh, Rue 38? These uh, yeah, I mean, you know, um, there's a lot of things, um, you know, Asian cleanliness. I mean, that's a big thing for us, you know, clean flavors, um, kind of the appreciation for each ingredient on its own before you try to dilute it with other things and transform it. So first we try to appreciate one ingredient and then we can go and, you know, either layer it or we might layer that ingredient multiple ways and get make it more complex. But, you know, some of the best food is just, you know, a carrot can just be a carrot. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Let, let's talk a little bit. Um, cause I, 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 I think, um, I can relate to this, uh, in my own life. You, you went to, let's talk about education. You went to business school first, right. And what was, was the goal? I'm, I'm really curious. Was the goal to, um, go to business school, but then you were going to go to culinary school or was it something that came to you after you were done with traditional university? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, um, I never really, because of my family, this is talking about, you know, earlier you asked about my grandmother and, you know, um, if she was very proud of me and she is, but in the beginning, you know, you don't, you don't become a cook, you know, Indians don't believe you become, that's, that's not a good thing. So I had always cooked and it was always a passion. And ever since I was 13, I mean, you know, I was working 20 hours a week, um, you know, when I was 13 and then until I hit 15 and then I was working 40 and, you know, and then we had summers and I could work 60 and it was just like, but it was always just a job. It was never supposed to be a career. Um, and so I went the traditional path. You know, I got, actually got a, a music scholarship. Um, so got a music scholarship, went to music school for about, you know, um, a few months in Boston until I realized that Boston gets very cold. Uh, and also <laughs> the type of music that I played was a uh, uh, bass clarinet. So, you know, the only thing I could do with that career would be to like be a concert um, you know, concert clarinetist in like a philharmonic. And uh, it's like eight hours a day of sitting alone in a room. And it just, you know, I never really thought about that until that moment. So I was like, this isn't for me. So then, you know, obviously since that was what I originally thought I was going to do, then you kind of do what everybody, uh, everybody who isn't necessarily sure what they want to do goes to school for, which is business. Um, so then I was doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I just remembered I got a uh, uh, um, I was working um, night times at a restaurant um, called Fire, and then morning I was working at a place uh, actually uh, a place I was working for Abercrombie and Fitch in the morning. Uh, oh, and, wow. and I remember Abercrombie and Fitch said that they wanted to bring me on as a manager, and that um, that um, they were going to offer me. Um, uh, a scholarship through Abercrombie Fitch to pay for my business school through Abercrombie Fitch. It was a great program. Uh, wow. Managers. So I remember going to my chef at the restaurant called Fire. His name was Carl Schubert. Um, he actually since passed away a few years ago from uh, uh, his stomach cancer. Um, but he, um, uh, I remember him telling me, like, let's, I, I, I approached him and said, hey, I, I need to put in my notice. Um, you know, I'm going to be going to work for them full time. They're offering me to pay for my school. I remember him saying, well, let's talk to you in the night. And he sat me down on these, um, you know, um, big uh, uh, milk crates. You know, we stacked up the milk crates and we <laughs> sat down and he just basically hit me on the side of the head and said, you're an idiot. He goes, you want to go work middle management for a clothing company? He goes, he goes you're an incredible cook. Um, you know, he goes, if you repeat this to anyone, you know, I'll, I'll beat you again. But um, you're the best cook here. Um, and uh, he said, this is what you need to do for a living. So. Um, that was kind of that driving factor for me to say, well, shoot, this is what I need to do. Um, so that's, uh, that's how I got it. All this happened in a very short amount of time. So, you know, I graduated, um, um, no, didn't graduate from any of those schools. And then all, all of a sudden, you know, was working at this restaurant and decided, Hey, I'm going to go to, um, culinary school now. And then, you know, in Florida still had, Florida has this great program called Bright Futures, um, which is, you know, they'll pay for your school up to a point. Um, so I was like, well, I have to stay in Florida. Um, let's look at um, culinary schools here. And then did a, a tour 
um, and then found, um, you know, in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, there's a place called the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale, um, and uh, picked them over all the other schools that I went to just because they had this really good international program. Um, so that was the initial reason for picking that school. No, that's awesome. I, I, I want to back up a little bit because when I love talking to chefs because it's either it's either they're in a rock band or they play an instrument or they ride a motorcycle or it's all of the above. So I love the clarinet story. I, what I was going to ask you is um, anyone that goes to music school and studies music and and gets a degree in music. You know, the worst the worst question you can ask them is, what instrument do you play? Because typically they can play them all. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I've got I mean, I've got like, you know, two saxophones, four clarinets. I got a guitar. We got a keyboard. So, oh, you know, I love it. I love it. There's a lot of, you know, I, I definitely declined in my music ability because I just haven't really played a lot. But, um, you know, it's, it's a big part of your life regardless. Uh, and even with my restaurants, I mean, you know. Um, experience um, is for dining isn't just the food; it's it's the whole package. So music plays a really big part in each one of my locations. I love that, and I'm going to totally catch you off guard here because this this wasn't planned at all. But whenever we get into a conversation around music, my son plays the sax, and I play the guitar. And I I, I mean, music is just a a big part of our life. My my daughter plays the piano. Um, so if I just said, Chef, hey, top bands of all top three bands of all time go Ooh, that's hard i play i listen to a lot of different things so i mean i would say probably red hot chili peppers is the first concert that i ever went to as a kid um <laughs> you know and i was like i was like you know, again you know 13 first concert like you know this like apprentice sushi chef rocking his life like you know in this in a kitchen with a bunch of like grungy you know cooks like these are like late 90s early 2000 cooks like grungy people I love it. I love um, so, it. I love you know, it. a lot of that, a lot of that. So Red Hot Chili Peppers is definitely my first concert. I love um, it. You know, I, I like them. You know, I'm really on a big Tedeschi truck band kick as well. Oh. Total gears here. Yeah. Um, so I've been listening to them a lot lately. And then, you know, I'm a big jazz guy. Um, okay, so cool. Love jazz music. Um, actually did a really, this is like eight, eight or nine years ago. Um, but um, the... Uh, uh, when Dave Brubeck died, um, his son continued his uh, quartet. So I remember one of my favorite memories is that he did a tour on this area and I uh, catered their brunch. Um, so I just oh, wow. remember, yeah, I just remembered like we're, <laughs> we're sitting there and like, uh, um, you know, the brunch is after their concert and like it's, um, you know, so it's, uh, it's now Chris Brubeck uh, with the Dave Brubeck quartet and we bring all these musicians from like France and all over there's like six guys and uh i just on this brunch they're all eating and they're like kind of like getting into the groove and i talked with them about how some musicians like oh we to play and like pulled out the one guy had a sax with him the uh drummer i just flipped a couple of pots and pans over on the thing and he's playing on the pots and pans and then you know so we had like this and then i had a um i just had coffee beans and a um uh or um the lentils in a um mason jar so i was just shaping them and we were all just playing like Oh my God, I'm getting chills. Rest, it was that so fun. So cool. Uh, it was so cool. So, um, yeah, some big jazz guy as well. Perfect response. Boy, did you handle that well. Very, very, very good. Probably the best ever. Hey, Chef, how important do you believe now, looking back, it was for you to attend culinary school? Because it sounds like it was important to you uh, versus, you know, just going from kitchen to kitchen to kitchen or traveling you know, just to having that formal education in front of you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that there's, uh, they're both pretty important in different ways, you know. Um, for me, uh, culinary school was great because, you know, when you are traveling and you are going to all these different cultures, you're going to these different cuisines, you kind of miss out on that history aspect of why food exists and, you know, um, you know, the kind of the basics behind, you know, Hope Cuisine and how we came to where we are in the world um, and what drove that that original idea. So it's really, really important to understand the history, understand the roots, um, to like, you know, cook those those classic dishes, you know, French classical dishes that um, really, you know, give you that foundation that you need uh, to move forward. Um, but for me, I mean, I actually, I didn't finish culinary school all the way through. Um, once we started getting 
outside of that foundational courses and started getting into like regionals and things like that, I felt less, I felt like I was already had that knowledge and already, already understood what I was going into. But, you know, that base foundation and really, really actually my favorite classes were actually in baking and pastry because that's not something that you really, you know, you have to go either work as an apprenticeship under someone for an extended period of time, whether it's one, two years, or you actually need to have someone who's going to be patient with you and have the time to walk you through, um, you know, the processes of making those things. And that laid really important foundations. And I think baking and pastry is a really, really important foundation nowadays, especially as we get into more, you know, not fully molecular gastronomy, but a lot more uh, technical aspects of cooking and a lot more pre precise and precision uh, with recipes and things like that. that. That foundation has to be laid from that, um, you know, from those classes and from that original cooking school. Totally agree. Do, do you find that, uh, let's, let's call it the French influence of Louisiana and that, and that part of the country finds its way to where you are in Florida? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, we have a lot of, uh, actually, my wife herself is from Louisiana. So, um, you know, there's a lot of Louisiana influence in what we've got going on. I mean, um, our original um, people that traveled here were from Louisiana. So, I mean, we have a lot of um, a lot of these southern style foods are just iterations of Louisiana. We have a lot of crawfish here, a lot of um, shrimp boils, you know, po boys, um, all along the coast. So, um, huge influence here. Actually, even Emeril Lagasse moved here. So, yeah, we've yeah, got, yeah. We've got Emeril here. Oh, really? He he's in your town there. Okay, he's in yeah. our town. Yeah, yeah. That's that's awesome. So so let's talk about travel a little bit. You've traveled a lot um upwards of 30 countries I mean, I mean which is i don't know that most people can name 30 countries so that's that that's pretty amazing and you know i would say you know as a cook that it truly is a you know a chef's dream to be able to taste flavors around the globe right and and even more so to understand how different cultures um you know approach food come to the table the fellowship that uh that exists around the kitchen table what was your motivating factor for traveling and cooking around the world, was it was it specific, specifically around learning, or did you just have that bug? I, I, I you know, I just got to do this while I'm young. Yeah, I think it was just definitely just the bug. I mean, yeah. the whole idea was like, you know, I'd like there's so much uh, in this world, and like uh, obviously with my parents, I said earlier that you know travel was a big part of our life in the, when I was young, and you know, going to India to see my, you know, grandmother and, you know, traveling, you know, I, I was part of a, a French, uh, French culinary, or not culinary, but French program uh, in elementary school that, you know, had us have French pen pals and, um, you know, for us to, we did even did school trips to France. This is a public school, this is a Georgia public school. I just so happy to have a French program. Um, so it was, uh, it was that bug that was kind of instilled in me and, you know, with, with my family in a very unique culture and living in a very white world. Um, and I want to kind of more of that culture. So that bug stayed with me and I wanted to see it all. So I uh, did a lot of travel. Um, yeah. Like you said, upwards of 30 countries. So I will say though, it's kind of cheating to say that it's upward of 30 countries because some of those countries I was in for maybe 48 hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you're still you know. there. You're still yeah. there. So, so I mean, the tougher question is then, Chef, is is you know, you know whether you're there for 48 hours or 48 days, right? You still you experience it, and I'm and I'm really curious as you look back and you look forward, how did all of that aggregate time or specific moments that you remember did it define you as a chef? Did it help you evolve as a chef? Did it give you guidance as you write menus today? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a huge part of it. I think one of the the most important factors with that travel was kind of understanding food's journey on its own. So you know how different cultures, because I mean you know when, when you define a culture, one of the most defining aspect of a culture is their food. Um, so I mean 100%. in any culture, you know there isn't there's that that's when you can think of like oh well, what what is let's say this culture you know insert country here what is this culture food is one of the top ingredients there and um you know as you travel kind of understanding how food traveled and understanding you know the, the the spice route and you know how different um recipes and ingredients travel to different countries and how they transformed and 
you know, we're bastardized and create something new and beautiful. Or, you know, um, I think one of the, the um, greatest references for that is just like, you know, Japanese and Portuguese, you know, um, you know, Portugal um, was, uh, you know, basically colonized Japan or the first, first people to see Japan. And, you know, they brought tea and things from Japan and from India and everything to Europe. And, um, you know, the Portuguese, the Portuguese word for tea is chai. The Indian word for tea is chai. The um, British word for tea is tea. Uh, well, tea is T-E-A, and it's called that because on the Portuguese chai bags, it said the Transport Exchange Authority, T-E-A, was on that bag. And the British was like, oh, it's a bag of tea. And like, I love it. I you, love you, know, it. You, you see things <laughs> like that. Or, and then even like how countries say thank you. Like, again, I'm just thinking uh, with Portugal as, uh, you know, uh, they say um, abrigato is how you say thank you. And arigato is thank you in Japan. So, you know, you have things like that. I mean, you see so many different perspectives, just like uh, um, uh, baklava is another one. Like, you know, baklava, every, who, who created baklava? Nobody knows because it's about seven countries that are all within the same region, you know. Turkey, Morocco, you know, um, uh, Lebanon, they all say, this is, this is mine, you know, Greece, this is my, but nobody really knows because they all kind of transport it to each other. And you know that there's, they were a big nomadic culture. So, you know, it, who's to say who created it because everybody was bringing that with them everywhere they went. So that, that's probably the coolest aspect of, of food and traveling with food and experiencing it. And then, you know, seeing, you know, for me, street food is a big part. Uh, like, I think that's the, the most um, unique part of a culture is their street food and, and experiencing different street foods in different countries too. It's fun just to like go on a stand and see what they're making. I, I love, I've had chills for like 45 minutes. I, 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 this conversation is just absolutely fun. I, I don't want to put you on the spot again, but I'm going to. So um, it's unfair for me to say what, what's your favorite cuisine, you know, from all that travel. Um, Cause it sounds like you've been influenced by, by much of it. But if you had to pick a podium, where do you, you've, you've got an Asian influenced restaurant, right? How would yeah. you, def, how would you define, uh, um, Route 30A? So, I mean, Route 30A, I mean, we, we call ourselves modern American, which is okay. just a, a blanket term for whatever we feel like that tag. Um, so I mean, Rue, Rue's menu changes every week. I mean, it's a new menu, six source tasting menu, um, you know, and it's, uh, evolves based on, you know, what we've got going on, what we've got bringing in. I mean, a lot of it, I mean, you know, I really hate that term farm to table because like everyone just uses it loosely, but we work with a farm collective called Davy Foods and they, they have, you know, uh, about 28 little small producers of farms, uh, small producers of vegetables and meats and things like that. They're all, you know, most of these are, you know, only a few acre farms um, and they uh, produce it and send it our way. And, um, you know, in these limited quantities and, uh, you know, we base our menus based off of that. And then, you know, we're here on the Gulf. So we have great fish. So we use a lot of seafood heavy, um, but just so you can get it every single day. Excuse me. Hold on, sir. If you, um, if you had to give some advice to a young culinarian, regardless of if they came up through culinary school or worked in your kitchen and knowing, you know, what your history was, how you learned, how you traveled, what, what would your advice be to someone who inquires about a similar journey? Yeah. I mean, I think um, the number one important thing I would say is bring, bring a, a notepad and a pen and uh, you know, <laughs> uh, write everything down. I mean, you know um, you can't remember everything and, and you can't try to remember stuff and you never know what, little thing that you see or whether it's a recipe or something cool that, that, um, you know, that inspired you in that moment, you'll you need to write down that it inspired you because otherwise it's easy to forget it as you get overwhelmed with just how much there is, um, you know, and we're constantly, I mean, the goal is to constantly keep on learning and keep evolving yourself and keep, you know, trying new things and trying new recipes. And I would say that, you know, having that to look back on and, allows you to be able to move forward without having to forget where you've been, you know? I, I, I absolutely love that. And I don't know if it's a chef thing, but you know, it, my entire life, it's either been in my back pocket. Sometimes they get a little bit bigger, you know, I, my kids think I'm nuts because, you know, you have the internet and you have your phone, but there's nothing, there's nothing like this 
keep all your notes in, right? All your travels. Let's let's talk a little bit more about Route 30A. Um, I mean, just just fascinating, a uh, fascinating story. Ten years, um, and then you opened the Noodle Bar as well. Um, boy, I'd just love to hear you talk in your words about like if you were going to write a book, you know, opening up your own restaurant and, and, and the experience that you create, you and your team create every single night for your guests. What does that mean to you? And, and, and are you just getting started? Yeah. I mean, I definitely would say um, I am getting started. I'm actually opening another restaurant right now. Um, we're also joining a food hall. Um, so we're opening up our noodle bar concept into a new food hall. So getting started. Yeah. Um, but I mean, for Rue and what we try to create, I and mean, when we open that restaurant every night, I mean, our ultimate goal and, and what we say a lot, I mean, you know, it's creating this experience of, you know, family and that experience of breaking bread and, you know, um, even our, our service, like our level of service, you know, we do a six course tasting menu, but, you know, I wouldn't consider us having, you know, you know, posh service in any way it's very very you know um relaxed very comfortable environment you know we don't require people to wear you know uh, a suit and tie to it it's just you know please please don't wear a tank top please don't wear flip-flops but come to dinner um and um you know we have when you first walk in I mean, you've got this great music playing you know you're handed in a glass of uh sparkling wine as soon as you walk in um, oh. you, know, you sit down together, um, you know, uh, the chef, the kitchen's right there in front of you. Um, and, uh, you know, you sit down next to strangers and obviously we make everybody cheers at the very beginning. So, you know, that's an initial kind of form of breaking the ice. And then, um, you know, as you read earlier, breaking breads is one of the most intimate things that you do. It really is. I mean, you know, to your point, you were sitting down next to those people in Boulder and, um, you know, they were talking about a cooking school, but you guys were already eating, doing the same thing. So it's easy to just kind of insert yourself into that conversation and create a new opportunity for yourself or a new friendship. And that's kind of what we do every day is that you know, we get these people to sit next to each other and we get them to meet each other. And, you know, they find out that, hey, we have the same, you know, same best friend went to school it's here and there. And it's, <laughs> you know, and they have, I mean, it's a six course base menu. So it's going to be over about three hours. That sure. you're sitting next to a total stranger after drinking, you know, we typically offer a wine pairing. So you may be on your third or fourth glass of wine by the time we get to it, but <laughs> you know, you've loosened up and you, you, you've, uh, uh, you know, become friends with these people. So uh, it's, it's, that's what we do. And that's what Rue's all about is that, um, you know, that breaking the ice, that getting, you know, as our world gets more digital and kind of um, pulls us away from being in very, in, you know, very um, intimate, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, I can't think of it. Uh, like a baby. It, like a, in, in personal in many yeah, ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Try, but trying to break away from that and create this um, environment where you have to be exactly who you are and talk with these people. And, and it's it's just fun. It feels really natural, right? Like, like you know, when you mentioned that you're handed a little bubbly when you walk in, that's what you do in your home, right? Your guests arrive back in the day. We used to call it company companies coming over companies coming over a very European thing. You know, I, I, I was thinking as you were speaking the other day, I watched probably for the fifth time. Um, Alain Ducasse has a, a documentary on um, <clears throat> I think it's on prime, but it's just about his journey over the last 20 years, 30 years. And <clears throat> opening up a new restaurant and, and he repeated it many, many, many times. And I, I don't even know how many restaurants Ducasse has now, maybe 30, maybe more, but he, he was real um, adamant about the fact that no, no two restaurants are the same. They do it different every single time, but the things that do remain the same, you mentioned, um, it was great food, obviously great team, um, impeccable service, right? So I, I'm just real curious, and now, now now you're on your third restaurant, but let let's go to Nanbu for for a minute. The noodle the noodle restaurant, how was that different? Was that intentionally different? Because it is different, right? It's yes, not a, it's not a tasting menu. It's it's a little bit more fast serve. It's fun food. It's got some of the Asian influences that you love. Um, talk a little bit about what it's like to open a second restaurant. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, nerve wracking for one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the most important things to remember is that, um, and you, you eventually have to make the decision what type of chef you want to be. Um, and there's a business book that relates to uh, cooking and, and chef and restauranting more than anything else, which is the E myth, uh, which is the entrepreneurial myth. Um, and it defines that, you know, do you want to be an entrepreneur? Do you want to develop and build restaurants? Or do you want to be uh, kind of a technician? Or do you want to be the chef? So if you want to be the chef of a restaurant, then you have to be the chef of a restaurant. You know, you're in there every day. You know, you're working, you're developing the recipes, uh, you know, the recipes. You're creating beautiful food every single night. And that's you that you're doing that with your team. Um, but if you want to become a restaurateur, you kind of have to give that up. You have to step away. You can still you can still give obviously your guidance and your rules and your rule books, but you have to be able to step away and say, hey, like you know, I'm doing this next thing and I'm growing and and developing myself in this way, and I know that I'm going to be losing out on some of this part that I love, but I can get it in other ways. So that was kind of the first part about opening a second restaurant is realizing you have to leave the first. Um, and uh, in order for each restaurant to be successful, you have to build the team um, that wants to be there. In order to build a team that wants to be there, you have to give them a sense of ownership, and which means that you can't necessarily be so controlling and be so on top of people about what food we're developing and giving them the opportunities to develop their own ideas and develop their own programs because that'll keep people longer than if you just tell them what to do all the time. I mean, so, you know, that was kind of the biggest thing to understand as I opened up my second restaurant was that with the person that I put in place in my first restaurant has to be someone who has the ability to be creative, has the ability to have that free form within my, you know, loose box of how I want things. Uh, and the, my, you know, rule set there and quality, I mean, quality is always there, but, you know, you have to make sure that it's still in the same style. Um, so that was the most important thing in opening the second restaurant. And, you know, Ducasse is a very smart man. Every restaurant is drastically different um, and opening it up is very, very different. But, you know, you do need to have kind of the same um, kind of core, um, you know, um, core beliefs for the company that has to stay the same across. So, you know, having quality of food, having quality of service, um, creating unique experiences. That's one of ours is that we want to, every restaurant that we open up, we want to create a unique experience. So Rue is this very, you know, very elaborate six course tasting menu. You know, it's meant to be fun and, you know, meant to be this really intimate experience that you're having with your family. And Namu is like this hip, like, city ball city kind of like club slash restaurant in this tiny little beach town um that plays 90s hip hops all the time with I have a 26 <laughs> I have a 26 foot octopus sculpture on the wall you know done by uh, Anthony Sachinski who's this great local artist that does all wood you know wood blocking sculptures we've got these crazy cool patterns and you know the color concept behind the restaurant was um the uh, bird of paradise plant so you've got like all oh, yeah. these vibrant yellows and reds and you know pinks and everything kind of plays throughout. And I got this crazy S couch in the front, right when you walk in, and it's a very small space. I yeah. mean, the restaurant's twelve hundred square feet, so it's a very small space. And <laughs> um, you know, so you got this blasting music, and then you got this really cool, fun, you know, ramen. And it was ramen centered, um, you know. And uh, I decided on ramen because I selfishly needed. Japanese food in my life and we didn't really I mean the closest place is like 45 minutes that's really good so it's like I want to do this I said but I also don't want to be the sushi chef um, so I can't start with sushi so we started with ramen because I knew that we could develop that and build that in a way that you know would allow it to you know be systematic and create this wonderful recipe and then nandu itself the word means southerner having been south in, in Japanese so we started with the concept that let's do a southern inspired uh, Japanese restaurant. That's where Nambu came from. I just love this conversation. I'm going to go back to the, my favorite quote inside of all that. Um, you know, how do you open up your second restaurant? You got to leave the first. So, so kind of a, a follow-up question to that. So obviously you leave the first so that you can focus on, you know, other, uh, other ventures. You leave it in the hands of someone that you're very, very comfortable with that, you know, can do it. How hard is that part? 
how hard is leaving <laughs> your best people there or taking your best people with you? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that, um, I mean, it's the hardest part. I mean, you have to, um, find who that person is and that's always a challenge and also understand that like, you know, people grow and develop in different ways. So you can always lose that person, you know, they can always have a great opportunity. So, you know, what we, what we try to do is we try to keep ourselves, um, very easy to communicate with and very open with all of our employees. So, you know, if someone has like a great opportunity presented to, to them, you know, we want them to tell us and we want to help them with that opportunity and grow into it. And, you know, we found that we found a lot more longevity by doing it that way with our employees and with our uh, core team um, that we probably wouldn't have had otherwise. So, you know, um, it, it's hard. And it's it's um, also hard realizing that, like, you know, um, it's not going to be perfect. And, you know, perfect is defined in your own head. You know, you define what perfect is. So, you know, what you think and what you focus on and what you look at when you're in your restaurant isn't necessarily what everyone else is going to be able to focus on or do or whatever. So, you know, there's there's a rule called 80-20, you know, talking about 80% um, of the population only goes for 20% of your product or, you know, you need to focus on at least hitting that 80% mark. Um, so that's what we do. We, we, we have a chef. He's in there. He's absolutely incredible. Can he give a speech like me? No. I mean, our chefs always present a crew. <laughs> Uh, the food, like they, they present each course. So the chef's presenting, it's not a server, it's the chef. And he is an amazing chef. He's an amazing cook. His name's John Engel. Um, and, um, but he's, you know, ex Marine kind of a gruff guy. And, you know, his speech is still, I mean, he still gives a great powerful speech, but it's this gruff, like kind of friendly thing, but, you know, our demographic in our restaurant is typically, you know, women 45 to 65 and, you know, they all want to change them. So they love him to death. They think he's a big teddy bear. So <laughs> it, it works out great, but uh, understanding like, Hey, you know, this is different. It is something, it's not me, um, but the restaurant's me. So it's okay. Um, that was kind of the, the hardest part in finding someone that could do that. Yeah. It makes total sense. Such, such a great conversation today. Chef, but before I let you go, the name of the podcast is The Ultimate Dish. This is probably the toughest question. In your mind, what is The Ultimate Dish? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, The Ultimate Dish is an experience. And I think that, uh, you know, you get your family, your, your closest family, your closest friends, whether your friends are your family, your family is your family. I think just getting a small group of people and, and having dinner together in just a really beautiful environment is the ultimate dish for me. So, um, you know, I think, um, let's say you get together and, and try to travel. I, I say always try to travel. If you can't afford to travel by yourself, travel with a group and group of people that you like to be around. Uh, and if you can get yourself out and, um, you know, look at, let's say you go on to Bali and you get yourself a, a um, you know, where you can overlook this beautiful sunset and sit at a table. And I don't really care if that dish is macaroni and cheese just the fact that you're sitting there in that beautiful environment with the best people in your life, you know, that's the ultimate dish for me. I love it. Perfect answer. Very emotional and, and, and absolutely lovely. Thanks so much for chatting with us today, chef. I've really, really enjoyed getting to know you. Now I want to get down to Florida and, and check out Rue. You need to check out Rue. And then, you know, we're opening up uh, the day trader Tiki bar and restaurant that'll open up March. So um, that's going to be right on the beach here in, in seaside Florida, um, which is about, you know, 10 minutes from Reno. So, uh, very excited to be here. And then, um, uh, you know, Nambu's got its little, um, uh, expansion into the food hall environment. We're opening up Nambu 2, T-O-O, uh, as a kind of a, a light, der a light derivative of what Nambu is. So we've got some cool stuff going on here and, you know, love for you to visit. Absolutely cool. Thanks again, Chef. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. It was nice talking to you. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Augusta Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe. <laughs>